Hello, this is Dr. Churchill, and I'm returning once again for your Astronomy 305 audio-visual lecture pleasure. Um, today, we are going to talk about the nature of life. Uh, the last time we uh, met, uh, quote-unquote, uh, we talked about um, why Earth is a very habitable planet, what are the characteristics that uh, help make it habitable, and um, in particular, we discussed its climate um, and the effects of um, life on climate and changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere uh, with time, um, maybe now ch maybe changing the uh, temperature uh, profile of the planet. Um, we're still in the midst of that and trying to understand that. Um, we also learned about the magnetic field and its importance, and we learned about um, the geology and um, the, um, the importance of uh, plate tectonics in driving energy from one place to the planet and keeping the cycle of the atmosphere stable over billions of years. So there's a lot of things going on with Earth that are, that are quite amazing and um, perhaps even essential for uh, living matter to uh, take hold and for living matter to particularly say evolve into something like ourselves that has the intelligence eventually to start thinking about these things. And again, I want to remind you that a lot of that knowledge is uh, less than 100 years old and less than uh, even some of it less than 50 years old. Um, we also learned about uh, absolute dating through radioactivity and you learned about alpha, beta, and gamma, and you learned about the magnetic spectrum. So I always like to provide a little review. Now, the big to-do in this class is life. And if you're going to talk about life, um, you've got to talk about what it is and what it isn't. And so I guess today's lecture is really our opportunity to define life and, in a sense, break it down into its component parts. And in particular, uh, to discuss this process of uh, reproduction and hereditary uh, processes and, and metabolism. Now, life is something that um, thrives where there's energy imbalance, where there's um, regions of high energy versus low energy. And life is this process which exploits that possible transition from low to high energy. Uh, it's a very, very um, energy demanding uh, process, if you will. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the nature of life on Earth as we know it. And um, I would like to then um, end the talk today with a little bit with some current events that are, uh, are less than a year old that have been, um, I think, somewhat mind boggling for, for us and in, in expanding our understanding of what the definition of life is. And, how well it can survive. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and bring us up to the lecture page. Okay, I hope you can all see that. And uh, I hope you all appreciate my little DNA in the background there. I'm trying to have fun backgrounds for each of the lectures. Okay, so uh, today is the nature of life. Uh, and we're gonna find out that in a sense that the, the, the fundamentals that make up life uh, are very few, <laughs> but the thing that is that those few things can express themselves in many, many, many ways. Okay, so let's talk about today's learning objectives. Um, we're gonna define what life is. And we're gonna talk about this four letter word. We probably ought to know what we're talking about. So we're gonna go ahead and put together a definition of life um, that we're going to talk about. Um, what is the role of evolution in defining life? So we're going to talk today about Darwinism. We're going to talk about the theory of evolution. And um, I want to teach you that you better not say that evolution means survival of the fittest, as if it's the biggest, strongest thing that goes around bullying the other things out of existence. All right. Uh, We'll talk about that. All right. Okay, so then we're going to talk about 
basic units of life. We're going to break life down. And it turns out, and you should know this as kind of a definition, that the, the basic unit of life is the cell. Okay, it is a single unit. And basically, uh, if you have life, um, you can have single cell life. That is the, the fundamental smallest unit of life as we know it. Okay, so what is a cell? What is it made of? What are the components? And what are the major groupings of life on Earth? In other words, when you put these cells together, we have developed something that's called the tree of life. And um, this tree of life uh, has branches. And so whenever you have a, a certain critter, uh, it fits somewhere on one of these branches. It's our way of organizing uh, or putting a filing system together for, for what life is. Um, okay, then we're going to talk about metabolism. As I said in the, in the beginning, uh, life is very, very uh, um, much a, an opportunist of extracting energy and using energy. So it's, it's basically a biochemistry process that uh, it really um, transmits or uses energy. It really, if the energy is available, it's a biological uh, organic chemistry process that really exploits energy to drive these processes. Um, and then what are the um, uh, classifications of metabolism? And it turns out that there's, there's four basic classes of metabolism. We're going to discuss those today. Then we're going to go back down to the uh, molecular level, the atomic level, if you will, and talk about uh, the hereditary material, which is DNA. We're going to talk about how you make a protein, um, how, you, how the DNA basically is a series of instructions that is designed to make the various components of your body that, that allow you to grow and allow you to age. Okay, and so how is that hereditary message uh, encoded in DNA? How are the instructions for making proteins, hair uh, cells, fingernail cells, et cetera, et cetera? And then um, how does life evolve? Well, we're, yeah, that's a little bit getting back into the Darwinism thing here. But for the, as far as the idea of life evolving, sometimes we think of abiogenesis, which is, you know, I've got some pool of organic goop, and how did that start to do, uh, how did that become life? That's called abiogenesis. Uh, we'll talk about that in the next chapter, okay? Um, life at the extremes, okay? Maybe you heard of them, maybe you haven't. They're called extremophiles. Now, when you think of the biomass on the earth, which is the mass of all living organisms, and you add up all that mass, and you figure, okay, what, what we call that the biomass, um, you might think that uh, the bugs and the birds and, and uh, the plant life and all these things that you can see are the major contribution to biomass, and that wouldn't be true. It turns out that over 90% of the biomass is actually microbial. Um, and it turns out that the high percentage of that um, bacterial biomass uh, live in conditions which would instantly kill you. Um, they live in what we consider extreme conditions. So Really, if you might think about it, when you look at the distribution of conditions on which life exists on our planet, we're in the minority. We're really the extreme uh, conditions that we have a very narrow range of conditions we're allowed to live in, whereas there's this broader range of conditions which life can persist and live in. And um, to us, they seem extreme. Okay, high pressures, high temperatures, uh, super dark, super cold. Um, things like this. So we're going to talk about uh, extremophiles, and this is the area uh, at the end of the lecture where I'm going to talk about the fact that uh, some new life forms have been found, and a new tree on the branch of life that didn't exist. We've only discovered it recently, and then I'm going to talk about some uh, life forms that may actually be able to live on, on the moon or on places that you wouldn't think of life existing. Okay, so we're going to learn some basic definitions about life as we know it and some um, difficult to imagine life elsewhere not having uh, similar functions in this way. Now, why do we say that? We're studying life in the universe. We've studied a lot of physics, if you will. We've studied a lot of astronomy and cosmology at this point in time. 
And we're, we're basically saying that the, the Carl Sagan argument, there's nothing special about earth. There's nothing special about the life on earth. There's nothing special about it in terms of the chemical elements that form it, the molecules that form it, the chemistry processes, which are driven through biological processes. All of that is absolutely not special. And so if you think about it, you want to just transplant, uh, you know, the, the thought of that, those processes, they could be happening everywhere in those billions of billions of planets that exist uh, in our Milky Way and uh, the, gosh, billions, uh, hundreds of billions, times hundreds of billions of planets in the universe. Okay, so let's get down to our list. Um, I think I've explained to some people through emails and questions that uh, whenever I have a list of things, that's usually a, a good sign that this is something that I want you to um, pay attention to. I just realized I didn't bring my coffee. I might have to take a pause and go get that. Um, so defining life. Um, we have six bullets here that describe life, uh, order, reproduction, growth and development, energy utilization, which I've talked about a little bit, response to environment, and then evolution and adaptation. And this is a really an important component of life for its long-term survival. Okay, so order. The universe is highly ordered. Life is also highly ordered. You have molecules that are organized into specific uh, groupings, patterns, and there's, there's not really any randomness to this. It's, it's highly ordered, and uh, we might even say that it's ordered to the point where uh, different parts are highly specialized as well. Reproduction. So basically, uh, life can duplicate itself. It is a um, highly, uh, it's, it's just driven to duplicate itself in a sense. It's, it's very odd. But the thing about that is that the, the, um, the offspring of any life, or what lawyers like to call the issue, the, the issue of a parent, or I should say the, the sons or daughters of parents, uh, they have the genetic material uh, that the parents have. So that, that when they reproduce, that that particular material is what's really passed. And so in a sense, we're all conduits for passing this genetic material from one generation to the next. Okay, uh, part of life is that it goes through growth and development, okay? I think we, as humans know that we grow, uh, we start out very small and we get larger, okay? Um, we have situations where once we get to a certain point, uh, the chemical processes in us uh, change, it's called puberty, the we have hormones, which are molecules that now are being reproduced at higher levels and it changes us so that we actually develop and grow. Uh, to, into a, um, a reproducible um, entity so that we can have offspring. Um, and the other thing is that um, the, the, the traits for that growth and development are programmed into our hereditary material. And so, you know, that's again, something that also is passed through the, uh, uh, from one generation to the next. Uh, growth and development happens with uh, insects. You go from a pupil to a larvae stage to a full-grown uh, adult insect. Uh, if you've ever watched uh, what happens with dragonflies, it's a tremendous transformation. We all know about polywogs and frogs. So this kind of uh, property of life is very common. Caterpillars to or worms to uh, cocoons and then to moths or butterflies. Energy utilization. This is where we're going to get into metabolism and we're going to talk about particular something called the ADP ATP cycle, um, which is a um, process that happens uh, in your mitochondria, uh, which are components to your cells. Uh, if we don't talk about mitochondria in this lecture, I know we do in the next. And um, this is a, a process where you can take uh, the chemical energy stored in molecules and then uh, uh, transfer it to a storage uh, mechanism that, that your body can then apply to, or all life. And it turns out that all life uses this. 
And then the thing is, is like, what is the energy and what are the elements that are needed to uh, drive the ATP cycle? What we're going to find is that there's four of them, four types of metabolism. You can get energy from light or you can get energy from chemical elements. Okay. All right. Uh, there's other parts to it we'll get into. Response to environment, okay. You walk in through the forest, you step on a twig, some rabbit's ear goes bump, the blood flushes from their uh, other parts of their bodies into their ears, expands their ears, the heart rate goes, you release adrenaline, um, awareness peaks. This is response, okay. So response to environment is um, a situation where if you have specialization, uh, within even a single cell, uh, a single cell can respond to its environment. And so um, this is an interesting thing about life. Um, being able to, something to respond to its environment does not define it as life, okay? But it's a, think of it as a, a biochemical process that uh, sets off other biochemical processes. That's what we call a response. And it just turns out that, um, in a living thing, it can cause multiple biological responses, including release of adrenaline, which then adrenaline itself is a molecule that then causes things to happen like rapid, rapid heart rate, and things like that. And finally, evolutionary adaptation. With evolutionary adaptation, um, this is what allows life to persist over long periods of time. Now, why is this important? Well, conditions change. For example, we've seen how the temperature on the earth has changed dramatically. And we even saw in the movie that when things were um, uh, in certain uh, conditions that say certain sea creatures thrived and other sea creatures didn't, and they died. And so life in itself is one of these things where it, uh, when the environment changes around you, it has to respond and adapt. And so clearly, um, if the environment changes such that uh, all humans can't take it anymore, then we're all going to uh, pass. And that would be the extinction of the human race. But on the other hand, there might be some humans that um, have small genetic differences that allow them to survive uh, these environments better. We're going to talk about one small adaptation called sickle cell anemia which is actually a mutation, and that's how evolutionary adaptation uh, actually is able to thrive, that we're not all identical. This is gonna come into our idea of Darwinism and evolution. We're not all identical as individuals. And sometimes mutations happen, which are errors. And then the question is whether the people who have those errors in their genes uh, are in an environment where they can continue to survive or not. Or maybe they're in an environment where that mutation actually uh, allows them to survive at better rates than the other people who didn't have the mutation. And so you see, uh, you have both these populations going on, those with, those without the mutation, and then the environment could change, or you could be in a local region of environment that allows the people with what we consider to be the mutation to have better reproductive success. And therefore, um, life can adapt. And then therefore, if all of the um, life forms that, or the humans that didn't have that mutation die off for some reason, now we have a new version of humans that that mutation is now the dominant form of uh, our genetic makeup. And that is what we call evolutionary adaptation. Okay, it's critical for life to survive over long periods of time and allows us to adapt to changing and various environments. Okay, now I'm going to stop sharing for a second and I'm going to pause my recording. And voila, coffee. So let's get back to our lecture. Okay, here we go. Much better. Okay. So let's talk about Darwinism. Let's talk about that hereditary process. Um, 
Now I'm going to talk to you uh, about examples that are called microevolution. If you really want to learn about how dramatic uh, evolution can be over millions of years, then uh, there's plenty of YouTube videos that really describe this in great detail. There's uh, some old, um, an old series called Paleo World, which was fantastic, which talked about how wolves uh, had evolved into whales, okay, for example. And that is a spectacular, uh, scientifically well-demonstrated um, lineage, if you will, of evolution, okay? Now, excuse me, um, what I'm gonna do to illustrate evolution is talk to you about what are called microevolutionary events, okay? So let's start with the premises and then go to the conclusion. Now, I'm gonna take the advantage to discuss with you what is a, sal a sound and what is a valid argument, okay? Now, a valid, why, why am I saying that? Because I think it's really important if you wanna have any critical thinking skills at all that you, you really know how to parse an argument. When someone says, therefore, you really should have a light bulb go off your head. Wait a minute, is this, is this a sound argument? Um, and then you can, uh, or I should actually say, is this a valid argument? When you say therefore, is it a valid argument? Then you can ask yourself if it's valid, whether it's sound, okay? And I'll talk about that in a second. To have a valid argument, you need a, a minimum of at least two premises. And a premise is, is a sort of a statement of fact, okay? And you need a minimum of two of them from which you, are led through a conclusion, led to a conclusion that these two premises, um, you, cannot, you cannot escape from them. I mean, they, they, the conclusion definitely has to follow, okay? So if that condition holds, then that's what you call a valid argument. Now, if the two premises that you state are demonstrated to be true to the best of our ability, then we would say it's a sound argument, okay? Because you can make a valid argument. If one of the premises is false, then it's not what we call a sound argument. You know, it doesn't hold water, okay? So what we want is a, uh, first of all, a, a, um, a valid argument that the premises uh, together lead to the conclusion. And then we, if the premises are true, we have a sound argument. So the theory of evolution is what we consider to be a valid and sound argument, okay? So let's talk about the two premises that go into it. Uh, it, it took Darwin a long time to formulate this, but we can put it together one slide for you. Uh, the first premise, number one, is that there is a struggle to survive on this planet, okay? and that you can have uh, overproduction and fill an ecological niche, okay? So we see this all the time everywhere you go. If you have a Petri dish or whatever, some bacteria, it's gonna fill and, until the Petri dish can't really hold it anymore. And now you've got pressure on that population, okay? It happens in every environment um, if that environment's able to, uh, sustain reproduction. So you get this struggle for survival, okay, amongst the individual members. This creates a population pressure, okay, that, that basically individual members are, are vying against each other for the resources in that environment. Okay, so as it says, creates population pressure, struggle for survival among the individuals in the population. Now, Let's talk about the individuals in the population. No two individuals in the population are identical, okay? Except for your statistical fluke of identical twins. So if no individuals are alike, no two individuals are alike, then that means that um, the way that they are able to compete in that environment is not the same, okay? Given the environment, individual one may have just a little bit more uh, adaptability, advantage, um, ease of survival 
than the individual too. And so you have this uh, broad sp spectrum of tra individual traits in all of your individuals that are competing in a single environment for all those resources. Okay, so no two individuals are alike. And so we end up finding is that some traits are better, and I'm gonna put that in quotes, under population pressure for a given environment. Now, the, the key is better is always relative to the environment, okay? You know, it, I could be in an environment with you, and in that environment, I might have some better traits for survival, like, you know, and we could be both of us taken to a different environment that's a little bit different or a lot different in some way, and I could have trouble in that environment, and you could find that that environment is a piece of cake for you to get along in. So what's better only depends upon the environment. And so you can clearly see that if the environment changes, the pressure on the population changes amongst its individuals. Some individuals are now get along, survive easier, and some less. Okay, you get the point. So number one, overproduction and struggle for survival in that environment. And then two, uh, each person is individual and therefore has their own unique way of interacting with the environment. And so that some traits are really well suited and some traits are not. Okay. What is the conclusion? The conclusion is unequal reproductive success. Okay. Notice it didn't say survival of the fittest. It's not the biggest or the strongest that can power through. It's not like I'm bigger and stronger than you. And therefore, you know, when, when we're in environment one, uh, I'm going to be better. And we go to environment two, which could be completely different. I'm still going to be better. It doesn't work that way. Okay. It's not survival of the fittest. It is unweak equal reproductive success, okay? Those individuals who have the traits so that it's easier to survive in, the, in that given environment are gonna have more offspring. They're gonna live longer, they're gonna reproduce more, and the others that are struggling, that have traits that don't allow them to survive as well, are gonna reproduce less. What's gonna happen with time? Those that keep reproducing are gonna generate their, their traits are going to continue on and their DNA and all their genetic variations are going to continue on. These are not going to. And so you get unequal reproductive success and your population with time changes its underlying DNA structure or hereditary code on information. Okay, so the conclusion is unequal reproductive success. That's this phrase I want to ring off of your mouth whenever someone says, what is the theory of evolution? Oh, it's the theory of unequal reproductive success, not survival of the fittest. Don't let me catch you saying that. Uh, of unequal reproductive success of individuals and those best adapted become progressively more common in the population. Here's a perfect little example. There's this little thing called the Industrial Revolution that happened in England starting around the 1890s. And um, we weren't so good at this gig of mechanizing the world at first, and we polluted with black soot from coal and covered trees in the ground. And it, it really got pretty nasty. And, and, and so what happened was, let's say you have this population of beetles, and let's just make it simple. 50% of them are white beetles and 50% of them are black beetles, okay? And, you know, these beetles get preyed on by birds and birds, they don't, they could see both of them equally well before the Industrial Revolution. They, let's talk about that period. They could see them both equally well. They are pluck off a white bug, pluck off a black bug, doesn't, it doesn't change. And so there was the, the, the pressure on the black and the white bugs was pretty much equal. There was no advantage of one over the other in that particular environment. Now let's change the environment starts spewing coal, starts spewing uh, soot, and uh, the tree trunks become black and the, you know, whatnot. And now the beetles are, are running around uh, and the black beetles are camouflaged by the black soot everywhere on the trees and whatnot. The white beetles are standing out like sore thumbs. Here we are, 
Well, so a bird comes along, white beetle, pluck, white beetle, pluck, white beetle, pluck, 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 pluck. Pretty soon, unequal reproductive success. White beetles, not so good. Black beetles, lots of reproductive success. The pressure's off on them. <laughs> the pressure went to the white beetles and they were no more. And so what happened is then, you know, go through several generations of beetles, okay, which, you know, this takes less than about a, a year with the lifespan of beetles. Uh, there's no more white beetles left. And so that's what we're watching with these panels A, B, C, and D is we're watching these birds pluck off these white beetles and eventually we only have these dark beetles in our population. That, ladies and gentlemen, is when an environment changes, showing you that all of a sudden now something simple like a genetic code, which changes your color to from, or genetic code that either makes you a black beetle or makes you a white beetle. And then the um, situation here is that soot was the environmental change and the white beetles uh, were at, at disadvantage. Now, the theory of evolution uh, came out of a, a excursion that Charles Darwin did down to the uh, Galapagos Islands, was one of the areas that he went to, but it also was the area that played apparently uh, a very strong role. And the, the f birds that were finches were something that gave him a strong clue. And it comes down to this uh, thought that we now call the common ancestor that developed from this line of reasoning. What Darwin noticed uh, was that the beaks on these different finches uh, seemed to be specialized and the specialization seemed to depend upon where they were. Okay, there were some areas that he went to like inland and he would see that in fact, these birds were uh, more insect eating birds and the insect eating birds tended to have longer, narrower uh, beaks. So it's easy to get in there and pluck them out and they didn't have to have a lot of crushing force and they could get the beetle in there and or whatever they were eating. And then he would go uh, you know, to uh, some of the islands that were more beachy and whatnot and the insects weren't as popular there, but lots of seeds and nuts were popular there and he would find out that their beaks were short and fat and had a lot more crushing power to them. They didn't have to you know, reach into small places to grab an insect real quickly. And so this was very interesting to him that he saw that the, the way that they had, had uh, interacted with their environment, their environments were different the way they interacted with their environment was different and the way that their bodies were designed were in a way specialized to those environments. So I think you get the point from our bug story that with time that the birds that were in heavily seeded environments developed the, the short fat seed beaks because it turned out that if they had a, very, a, a variation that allowed them to eat seeds um, more successfully than the other birds who had longer beaks. In those environments, the, there'll be unequal reproductive success of the, the, the seed eating beaks. And vice versa in the environments where the bugs are very plentiful, but the seeds are not, it would be that there would be unequal reproductive success, that those with long beaks would, would dominate uh, reproductive reproduction and dominate the population over several more generations. Um, this is a process called natural selection. And this was really Darwin's greatest idea. And it was transformative. Again, it was in the mid 1800s, um, around the time of the Civil War, that he produced this material. And uh, it really, it really was controversial and very much changed our ideas about how life existed. And so it's a well-established uh, theory, and it um, there are so far there's no evidence that we see on life that is contrary to the theory of evolution. In the same way that we saw that so far there is no observation that we've made of nature that is really contrary to the predictions of Einstein's general relativity, 
we see that there are no observations of our planet that are contrary to the theory of evolution. Okay, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, last time we talked about radiometric dating, we talked about the atom, uh, protons and neutrons in a nucleus, electrons uh, swarming around the nucleus such that there was an equal number of electrons as there were protons in the nucleus, so the net electric charge was neutral. Hydrogen was one proton with one electron orbiting it. Carbon had a nucleus with six protons uh, in its nucleus and six electrons. And um, oxygen, I think, was eight protons with eight electrons. So clearly, uh, the way electronic bonds happen is through the electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus. So if I have a, a proton here with an electron orbiting around it and another proton here with an orbiting electron, they can come together and the electrons now can orbit both protons, okay? And so you have two separate protons or two hydrogen nuclei two, and two electrons orbiting around it and it ends up holding the, the protons and the electrons together into a bond. We call that an H2 molecule, an H with a sub two behind it or below it. And this is the form, this is how chemical bonds are, are made. And you probably had some high school chemistry and know what I'm talking about and wish I wouldn't review such things sometimes. Now carbon has six electrons orbiting around it. And you might think, wow, carbon could bond its one electron to all these different other elements. Like you, you would think one carbon might be able to bond with uh, six hydrogens. Well, it turns out that's not exactly how the electrons are structured for quantum mechanical reasons that I'm not gonna go into the way that atoms are structured. Not all of the electrons are always available for doing chemical bonds. But the ones that are available have a special name, which you're not gonna to need to know, but they're called valence electrons. So it turns out that carbon has four valence electrons. So it can only do up to four bonds at a time, even though it has six electrons. Now, it turns out that without going into great detail about all of this, that carbon is the most versatile element that is a, an abundant element in terms of the chemical bonds that it can engage in. Okay, first of all, if you remember right, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, in addition to hydrogen, um, and helium are the most abundant elements in the universe. Hydrogen and helium made 13.6, 13.7 billion years ago in the Big Bang, and carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen can built up through nuclear fusion in the cores of stars of previous generations of stars, and then, and then polluting the uh, region of the galaxy from which our solar system and planet formed, and that carbon and nitrogen and oxygen are very abundant in and integrated into our life. Uh, so carbon, it turns out, out of those most abundant elements um, has the most versatility for bonding. It can do up to four bonds, okay? It actually is so versatile, sometimes it can only, uh, it can just decide to bond with one uh, electron and sometimes it can uh, decide to bond up, up to four different times with four different elements. Um, with one electron each, okay? Um, sometimes we're gonna talk about the fact that it can do something called double bonds, okay? So that means like uh, with oxygen, oxygen has two valence electrons, uh, carbon has four. Carbon might say, oh, I'm gonna share two of my electrons with the oxygens, two electrons, and I got a very, very strong bond now because I have what's called a double bond. I'm, I'm using two of my electrons to bond with the oxygen of carbon. So carbon can do single bonds, which is to say one electron, or it can do double bonds, which is to say two electrons. This is a, a very, very versatile situation uh, as far as chemical bonds go for a given element. Also, I'd like to say that double bonds are stronger bonds, okay? So it can make bonds that are actually very hard to break. And this is, makes them stable. Stability is good for life, all right? So 
we're going to talk about these particular carbon chains or carbon molecules. And they're given a name. They're called organic molecules. And basically, organic molecules are those in which they are constructed of uh, carbon atoms or multiple carbon atoms in, ch in what we call chains. OK. OK. So uh, these are also known as hydrocarbons. If they only have hydrogen and carbon in them, they're called hydrocarbons. Uh, don't light a match to hydrocarbons. They love to burn. They, they oxidize. And uh, you might say that ethane and methane uh, are highly flammable gases. And ethane is actually 10% um, of most of your gasoline that you put in your car. Um, you'll see that at the pump contains 10% ethanol or something like that. Um, so here's, here's an ethanol uh, hydrocarbon, uh, two carbons with a single bond, and then the other three electrons uh, uh, each go to one hydrogen. So one hydrogen, one electron, one electron, one electron, one electron. These guys are sharing one electron each. These are sharing one electron each, and so you have these single bonds. And it can get very versatile. And you could you could add another one of these little C three H or C H three groupings to um, an ethane. And so instead of having a hydrogen here, you could put a, a carbon there, which can bond to three hydrogens. You could add infinitum, add more and more and more and more and more until you get you know 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, 000, I'm, I'm just joking. But you can get very large uh, chains of these carbon atoms with their, that are in these hydrocarbons. You can also replace one of these hydrogens, say, for example, or in this case, this molecule, replace this hydrogen with a carbon, and you can get another uh, grouping of uh, CH3 out here. So that can happen at the end. It can happen in the middle. You can, okay. Or let's say the fact of the matter is uh, you've got this molecule and you knock one of these hydrogens out. And so the electron from this guy, and you knock, this, knock these two hydrogens out. Now these two electrons, uh, one from here and one from here, are available to come down here to this image to bond, double bond. And so you can see you can have a super strong bond here, a double bond that puts these two uh, hydrocarbon molecules together. You can get rings. There are things called benzene rings. Uh, there's even thing called buckyballs, which are just pure soccer balls of carbon atoms. Okay, so you can get three-dimensional. You can get two-dimensional. Here is a, a, a nice little single bonded ring where all the uh, other electrons then are bonded to the hydrogens. Here is a ring in which you see every other carbon is double bonded. So. Uh, this has four electrons, two here, one here, one here. This is four electrons, two here, one here, one here, okay, and so on and so forth. And um, this makes carbon extremely versatile. And like I said, uh, the fact that it can do up to four bonds makes it versatile. The fact that it can do double bonds is even more versatility, and they're strong. Now, let's talk about silicon. Silicon is pretty abundant in the sand of the beaches and in the mantle of the earth. Okay, it's a pretty abundant element, not as abundant as carbon, as far as the uh, astro astronomy goes, as uh, stars producing elements, carbon's more abundant. But silicon is fairly abundant element in the universe. It's very abundant on the planet. And uh, the question then is, you know, why not silicon-based life? And the reason I ask that question is because on the periodic table, Silicon also has four valence electrons. So what's the difference? Well, it just turns out for some reason, because of the bonding structure of those electrons, that of those four valence electrons, that silicon cannot do double bonds. It can only do single bonds, OK? And therefore, all of the bonds uh, are, it cannot do those super strong double bonds. The other thing is that because of the electrical properties and the bonding uh, energies of those electrons to the silicon nucleus, the, the electrons cannot bond as strongly in molecules. Okay, they're too strongly bound to this, the central nucleus of the silicon itself, and therefore they cannot share in high energy strong bonds with the uh, in, in molecule bonds. And so silicon bonds 
uh, are weaker than carbon. And so if you're hydrogen and you're bonded to silicon, it turns out, you know, it doesn't take much to separate the two of them. Um, that bond is weak. And so, but with carbon, if you're bonded to hydrogen, it's much stronger. It takes a lot more energy to separate those two. And that makes it more stable. And life wants, you know, it's an advantage for life for its bonds of its uh, chemical elements and its molecules to be uh, strongly bonded together. Now let's, let's talk about what we are by mass, okay? Now this is not a discussion of what we are by the number of atoms, but by the mass of the atoms, okay? Uh, for example, uh, you probably have more hydrogen atoms in you than anything, but by mass, because hydrogen atoms have so, each hydrogen atom has so little mass, you're not dominated by your hydrogen mass. Okay. What you are dominated by are organic molecules, which are carbon based chains, and you're basically, other than that, a big bag of water. All right. 70%. Uh, of your by number of your atoms or your molecules are water molecules. You are 70% water. Okay, that means that you're dominated by H2O. Okay, so a water molecule here, figure 3.7, is an oxygen and two hydrogens bonded together. Remember, I said oxygen had two valence electrons, so it can bond, make two bonds, and hydrogen can make one. So, bam, it's a nice, beautiful molecule of abundant elements in the universe, turns out to be quite a good friend of ours, water. And so since we're 70% water, we are mostly made up of oxygen and hydrogen atoms, okay? And, um, or I should say a lot of this is made up of water, hydrogen and oxygen atoms. So um, it turns out then that oxygen, uh, is what we mostly are by mass. Even though we think of our structure uh, as being carbon-based, you take all the water out of us, you take away over 65% of our mass. Okay, actually more than that, because the hydrogen that's connected to the water makes up 10% of our mass, and the oxygen that's in that water makes up 65% of our mass. So you add those two together, that's 75% of our mass, I guess I misspoke earlier, it's not by number, water, 75% by mass, you are made of water. And most of that mass in the water is the oxygen because the oxygen uh, elements are actually 16 times heavier or more massive than the hydrogens. So if you do all that math, you find out, yeah, we're 75% water, but as far as the single element that we are most, most of our mass is, that's oxygen at 65%. Now carbon, which, you know, is the next probably uh, mass contributor to us, um, is less than 20% of our overall mass. So you take all the water out of us, yeah, we dominate, we're dominated by carbon, but the water in us makes us dominated by the by mass of oxygen. Okay, so here's the little table here. And I, you know, I like everybody to just understand that by mass, you are mostly water, and therefore by mass, you, the element that you are most of by mass is oxygen, okay, not carbon. Okay. So why not oxygen-based life? Well, the oxygen's pretty busy. It's uh, bonded to water. And again, it's not like carbon. Oxygen can only make two bonds, and they can only be single bonds. Carbon, it can do up to four bonds, one, two, three, or four. And sometimes it can do double bonds, OK? So it's much stronger. Okay. Again, that's what this read down here. Carbon has the greatest diversity and strength of chemical bonds, up to four at a time, and sometimes double bonds. Oxygen cannot can do two bonds. Hydrogen can do one bond. They're only single bonds. Okay, now let's talk about, and in a sense, some three-dimensional structure of these molecules, because it turns out that the three-dimensional structure of these molecules is very important. And we don't really talk about it a lot, but you know, um, if I'm a carbon, um, 
atom, and I'm going to bond to a hydrogen. I bond to a hydrogen. Okay. Then I bond to another hydrogen. You know, what's the three-dimensional relationship between those? I, are they going to be like next to each other like this? Are they going to be opposite each other like this? You know, how are they going to be? Now, if you get a carbon, it can bond to four hydrogens. So I got one, two, and then I got three and four. I hope you can see me in my little uh, window here trying to wave my arms around. The point is that the hydrogens will, will try to be as far apart from each other as possible. So you can think of it as a carbon in the middle, two hydrogens that way, and two hydrogens that way. So it's, it's really a, a, a three-dimensional structure. Water, same thing. The hydrogens tend to be at about 120 degrees from each other. So there's a shape to all these molecules, especially these long chains of carbons where you've got some oxygens, and hydrogens, and nitrogens, and things like that in there. It gets very complex, and you get a shape, okay? So, okay, now, just like your hands, which have a shape, okay, try to do that. Um, this is a hand, but this is also a hand. And the situation is that one is a left hand and one is a right hand, and I know that's backwards on your screen relative to me, okay? And they're, they're mirror images of each other, okay? And so it turns out that molecules can be this way too. I've described some fairly symmetric molecules a moment ago, but you, they can be very asymmetric in their shape, but then they can uh, bond in such ways that there are mirror versions of the same molecules. And so we, we call this handedness, which is also sometimes called chirality. Okay, it's written in word there, in, in red there, chirality, sometimes called handedness. So, and we say that some molecules are left-handed and some molecules are right-handed. Okay, that's great. Now, it turns out that that's important because it's the shape and the electrical fields or the variations in the electrical fields around. So you might have molecules that uh, one side of them has more negative electric uh, field energy and the other side has more positive electric field energy. And that will be different than the opposite handed version of the molecule that the, the uh, overall shape uh, and the electric field um, distribution will be opposite of each other now and the same thing in the same reason that my thumbs are on opposite sides of my arms. Okay, so this leads to a sort of lock and key type of chemistry that is one model of how uh, biochemistry works. And I would say that things have gotten more sophisticated than lock and key, but it's still a good thing to talk about lock and key. It's still a useful model to discuss. So in figure 3.10 here, we show what's, what might be a version of a left-handed molecule. You could think of a mirror here, and this is a right-handed molecule. All the chemical bond geometries are the same, except just like with my hand, they're, they're mirror images of each other. Okay. Now, life doesn't willy-nilly uh, just use one, uh, use both uh, left and right-handed molecules. Life has uh, developed a, lo a lock and key type of um, chemistry to facilitate biochemistry and that um, it has adapted all one-handedness and the handedness that it adapted is what we call left-handedness. So you should think that all life is sinister, which is the, the Latin word for left, okay? Um, so all, all life is left-handed and that's gonna be my magic word. Sinister, let me write that down, because that's kind of a fun one. Sinister, cool. I'll have to think of some, some cool words that uh, are red herrings, if you will. Ooh, red herring might be a good one, too. Um, anyway, sinister, our, our magic word. Um, so what we have here is that um, all, all life is left-handed in its chirality, something that I want you to know. And this is uh, something that we've used uh, to help people not gain weight, okay? So, for example, uh, sugar. Sugar is a left-handed complex organic molecule that we metabolize. People got the idea 
that what if we generated sugar synthetically in the lab and separate all, all the left-handed sugar and sell that, okay? And then separate out the right-handed sugar and sell that. And why would that be an interesting thing to do? Well, it turns out it tastes the same, virtually the same, and, but it doesn't metabolize because it's right-handed and our bodies only metabolize left-handed molecules, okay? Now, when we eat sugar cane, sugar coming up from a cane is all left-handed and we metabolize it. So life is all in that way. Now, you go out into space and you pull some rock off of a, a meteorite and you look at the organic molecules uh, that are in there, 50% uh, will be right-handed and 50% will be left-handed. Nature tends to make them in equal uh, proportions, but life itself has adapted only one and that is the left-handed. So I just want to bring that, uh, bring that home to you. Now, I said earlier at the beginning of the lecture that the basic unit of life is a cell. Let me say that again. The basic unit of life is the cell, okay? The smallest living life form that you can have is a single cell. And um, that just might be a true-false question on a test or a quiz or something like that, because I really think that's a, a fundamental thing about life that you should walk away knowing, okay? Now, there are multiple kinds of cells, and they have different functions, okay? Uh, there are four basic cell types. They are bacteria cell types, amoeba cell types, plant cell types, and animal cell types, okay? Excuse me. Now, we are going to later uh, break down cells into something called prokaryotic cells, and eukaryotic cells, okay? And it turns out that some of these are prokaryotic cells. The bacteria and the amoeba are prokaryotic cells, but the plant cells and the animal cells are eukaryotic cells. But they're still, they're still broken down. The, the prokaryotes are, are definitely bacteria and amoebas, and the eukaryotes are plant cells and animals. Now, don't worry about prokaryotic and eukaryotic until next lecture, I think, is when I talk about them, I think. Sometimes I can't remember all the details that are in my slides. Okay, um, living matter resides inside the protective membrane, okay? So there's a, a, a specialized structure that is the outer layer of a cell. It's kind of the boundary, if you will. We call this the membrane. And we're gonna find out that this is constructed of something called lipids, all right? Um, Okay, and then there are structures that are, uh, that protect, that they are structures that protect the cell and the reproduction, uh, reproductive molecules in the cell. Okay, some organisms are single cell, that's why it's the basic unit of life, and other complex organisms, organisms like ourselves can have trillions of cells that cooperatively work together. Okay, um, now, we talked about Darwinism's uh, evolution, and we talked about the idea of a common ancestor that came from the idea of how the finches had developed, okay, that maybe way past, way, way, way in the past, before those islands had separated geologic, geographically from each other or geologically separated, that all finches were roughly the same and they come from a, a, a um, um, common ancestor. Well, since cell is the basic form of life, the first life was probably single cell, and it's really believed that all life probably originated from some common ancestor that was a single cell organism. So that's why this is in red here, that, that we can infer that, and we can't prove it. We have uh, nothing that scientifically disproves that supposition at this point in time. Uh, I wouldn't call it a theory, it's, it's a hypothesis. Um, that all life originated from a single cell organism. Okay, now let's talk about those components of the cell, such as the membrane and the parts and things like that. Okay, and so 
those main, the main components that make up a cell are actually the ones that you read about on the food you eat. You know, you look at the label, it's got so much protein, it's got so much fat, and it's got so much carbohydrates. Okay, um, those are basically the four groupings of molecules that form structures that give cells their ability to uh, have integrity, structural integrity. And then the fourth uh, one that you have are the nucleic acids. And these are the genetic material, the DNA, or the um, assistant to the DNA, which is called RNA, okay? And this is a, a kind of a messenger or a transfer molecule. Okay, I, we, I like to call it the DNA assistant or the assistant of the DNA. Okay, so carbohydrates, uh, basically uh, provide energy and build structure. A lot of fiber develops cell integrity. You have lipids. These are fats. Okay, so you know it says fat on your on your little label for your food. We technically call those lipids. Okay, so uh, uh, fats are lipids. So number two is lipids. They store energy for future uh, use, and then they really are part of that. Uh, cell membrane as well for a lot of life. Some cell membranes uh, include uh, proteins, but um, mostly um, it's the lipids that form the, the cell boundaries. And then you have proteins. These are the workhorses of the cells. These are long carbon chains. They're built out of something called amino acids. And these are the things that actually go and do work around your body uh, and build things, uh, bond together to build things and uh, tear things down. Okay, uh, and then of course the DNA, which is a hereditary material. If you uh, look at the bottom uh, diagram down here on the left, uh, this is a perfect example of what a membrane to a cell looks like. Okay, um, this, these are meant to be uh, diagrammatic of long carbon chains. You know, there's a bunch of those uh, carbons with hydrogens bond to them, as we saw in the previous diagram. And these are the more complex things uh, that they can form rings or they could be very complex shaped little molecules. But the point of the matter is, I, I, I was telling you that the molecules um, can have uh, a, an electrical distribution around them, sort of either they're, they're sort of a negative on this side and a positive on this side, electrical distribution. We call that a polarity. Um, but you can have such long molecules that on one side, uh, you, you see a lot of electrical distribution, but on the other side, it might be that it's, it's kind of all blurred together and there's no polarity from one side of that little area of the molecule to the other side. And that's what they're trying to show here uh, with these yellow spots, um, that these are the areas that have some electric polarity, and these are the areas which don't have any electric polarity. And it turns out that water has an electric polarity to it. So if you have a big old organic molecule that has electric polarity over here, it will electrically become attracted or repelled from the water and become oriented in the water in a certain way. Whereas the long tail, which doesn't have any electric uh, polarity to it, will just stay away and hang away from water. This is the phenomenon, and I'll talk about it again, in, I think in the next lecture, that allows oil to separate from water, okay? Oil has no polarity and, and water has this polarity. And so without the polarity, the oil just separates out of the water. It doesn't give a stitch about the water. Well, you have organic molecules that are long and one part of the organic molecule doesn't give a stitch about the water and the other one does. And so the, the molecules line up in the water and they'll line up next to each other, okay? And so um, you have what might be considered to be a hydrophilic head. Now hydrophilic, hydro is water and philic means lover. And so this is the lover of water. And so this will, will tend to uh, stick its head in the water, if you will. And the hydrophobic tail, water hating or fearing, just a bunch of Latin words, will 
will move away from the water or not be attracted to the water, just sort of hang out and not care about the water. And then you could get the, an, another row of these, which then um, align as well. And so you get back to back uh, alignment of these uh, lipids and this causes to have a beautiful membrane. And so I want you to remember that, that it's lipids uh, that are part of making up the cytoplasm, um, which is the, I'm sorry, which make up the, um, the bilayer of a membrane. And if going back to the other thing, um, I think the word I'm looking for is cellulose for say tree um, membranes, okay. Um, if we look at the overall uh, cell, it, these, uh, these layers, uh, double cell uh, bi bilayer membranes, uh, can form complex structures such as this throughout a cell. And you can see here, um, these are cutaways showing you that you can get double layer membranes like this uh, that are blocking uh, material from going in and out and forming a protective layer. Well, I guess I lied. I guess we are talking about prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells today. Okay. So this um, basic cell structure, you know, I, I don't want to confuse you. So let me back up just a hair. Okay. So we said there are four basic cell types, bacteria, amoeba, plant cells, and animal cells. I guess let's just, if you're gonna get quizzed on that or you wanna know, well, gosh, are there two or are there four? I'm gonna go back and backpedal on this and say, I want you to think of there really only being two major types of cells, okay? Let's forget about the distinction between a bacteria and an amoeba and the distinction of a plant cell and an animal cell. We're gonna basically group these into prokaryotes and we're going to group these into eukaryotes. So I want you to walk away from this lecture going, there's basically two basic cell types, okay? And what are they? They're the prokaryotic cells on the one hand and the eukaryotic cells on the other hand, okay? Now, if I was to say, what is the most defining, obvious characteristics that's different than between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. I would say the number one most clear difference is that eukaryotic cells have an internal membrane that protects the DNA and the hereditary material. So this picture here that I'm circling is a eukaryotic cell and you can see it has very uh, protective layer membranes and a lot of layers of these bilayer membranes, but it has this other nuclear membrane, which is protecting all of the DNA and hereditary material. The U, the, that's a characteristic of eukaryotic cells. Characteristic of prokaryotic cells is that they only have the single outer membrane, okay? So biggest difference, eukaryotic cells have an internal membrane, for a nuclear membrane, if you will, and prokaryotic cells only have the external single membrane. What's the second biggest difference? The second biggest difference is that eukaryotic cells contain organelles. Organelles are small, little, separate cells in their own right, okay? Um, and in fact, you have um, little cells inside your, in your eukaryotic cells, you have other little organelles. These organelles themselves, guess what, are prokaryotic cells, okay? So they're, they're of their own little cells that live inside of the eukaryotic cells. It's a symbiotic relationship, and it's one that's going to give us some tremendous clues in the next chapter to help us understand the development of complex life on planet Earth. So Prokaryotic cells do not have organelles. I mean, it's basically, it's a prokaryotic cell. It's all by itself, and it has a single outer membrane. Eukaryotic cells, they also, in addition to their internal nuclear membrane, that's a double protection for the DNA, they have organelles, which are to say that they have a symbiotic relationship with embedded prokaryotic cells. So those are the two main differences. But 
There's some other differences too that you can put into some lists. So I have uh, the most common uh, cells by number are prokaryotic cells. There's more simpler things in the world than there are complex things. So there are, these are the most common cells on the planet. They're simple. There are, they are single-celled uh, life forms that are prokaryotic life forms. They're much smaller, as you can tell from this picture. Uh, prokaryotic cells much smaller than a eukaryotic cell. They, again, have no nucleus, no nuclear membrane, and therefore no nucleus. Um, they form on the tree of life uh, bacteria and something called archaea, which are just a little bit more complex than bacteria, if you will. Um, and so um, examples of prokaryotic cells are E. coli and salmonella. Also, uh, your mitochondria are prokaryotic cells, or in trees and uh, photosynthetic eukaryotic cells, uh, the organelles are chloroplasts. And so these, so anyway, uh, some of these uh, prokaryotes are E. coli and salmonella, which you know are not good for your gut. You have all kinds of prokaryotic cells in your gut um, as part that are living symbiotically in your body. Now, um, again, I boxed the most important thing. They only have the single membrane. Uh, eukaryotic cells, obviously much more complex. You can have life forms that are single eukaryotic cells, and you can have multicellular uh, um, uh, life forms, okay? And then they're obviously, they're much larger than the eukaryotic cells. They have the nuclear membrane. Uh, that means they have a nucleus. Uh, eukarya on the tree of life are anything that is, uh, comprises uh, eukaryotic cells is considered eukarya on the tree of life. And then um, there are single cell versions of, of this, which are called amoeba. So even amoeba are basically different than bacteria and archaea than the fact that amoeba themselves are eukaryotic um, and have little prokaryotic symbiotic cells in them. And again, the most important thing boxed here is that the genetic material is double protected in a nuclear membrane. Okay, eukaryotes need prokaryotes to survive. Okay, so prokaryotes are the organelles which are necessary then uh, for the eukaryotic cell to continue to do all of the mechanisms biochemically that it does. And we'll talk about that more later. So let's talk about the three domains on the tree of life, okay? And um, we have basically on this tree of life, uh, the bacteria that we talked about and the archaea, okay? Single cell uh, prokaryotic cells that these four life forms are made of. And then we have the eukarya is our third branch. And so these are all life forms, amoeba to, you know, things like butterflies and trees and fungi like mushrooms and humans and, you know, kangaroos. These are eukaryotic uh, life forms that are made of eukaryotic cells. Now, um, this is interesting because we want to think about the idea of some kind of common ancestor to all of life. And so let's, this is, think of this as a time axis going from early time to present time up here. So time moving upward like this. And the idea was that there was this earliest life form that was a single cell prokaryotic cell. And as time went on, eventually it separated into the more complex archaea single cell life forms and the bacteria uh, prokaryotic cells. And this is one of the first separations that happened. And then it turns out that archaea and eukarya have more traits in common than bacteria do. So it's believed that it would be later in time that the eukarya and the archaea split into two group, uh, separate uh, branches on the tree of life. And so uh, as we come along up this time scale, we see that the archaea would break off. Now, eventually, the, all the different life forms that are eukarya on the planet would break up and form sub-branches on this third branch, main branch of the tree of life. 
And the same thing happens with bacteria. There, there's a, all these little sub branches of the various types of bacteria and types of archaea and then types of eukaryotic life, which I think we know is a, uh, from our own personal experience, uh, a great variety of. Okay, so how do we do this a little bit, uh, understand this more, just not in terms of cell structure and cell functionality, it's mostly done in terms of genetics, okay? You, you break down the, the entire genetic sequence of bacteria, you measure the entire genetic sequence of archaea, you do it for our, our, uh, eukarya, and it turns out that there's more of these gene sequences, genetic sequences that are in common with eukarya and archaea that would say that they are, are closer in time, uh, closer ancestors. Um, and so that, that's, one of, that's the reason we really believe that the eukarya and the archaea are, broke off later uh, in time than say that the archaea broke off from the bacteria, okay? Okay, so now we've talked about cell types and cell structures and carbon bonds and all this fun stuff. We know that life is made up of a lot of organic carbon-based molecules, okay? And so carbon is clearly an important elemental ingredient for life to survive. So we need to have carbon. Carbon, bring on the carbon. Bring, I have to digest carbon. I have to continue to uh, replenish the carbon I have. Um, the other thing is I need energy, okay? And so the two processes that we care about that keep life sustained um, are going to be the ingestion of material to continue to build life and the ingestion, if you will, of energy, which could be chemical or uh, heat or other some forms of energy uh, to keep life going. So we basically need uh, raw materials and we need energy. And that's what metabolism is. Metabolism is, metabolism is the processing of the materials and the energy to sustain the biochemistry that is my, what keeps me alive, okay? The, the biochemistry of life. So what are the basic metabolic needs? Number one, raw materials, okay? You gotta build the cell walls. You need a lot of carbon to the, the basis of all those molecules that make up the lipids and the proteins and, and whatnot and the carbohydrates. And then you need the source of energy in order to make all that chemistry happen so you can take that carbon and the, those other things and put them in a form that you want and move them to where you need them to be to do the chemistry you need to have happen so that you can survive. Okay. All right. So there's two types of, of, of energy, if you will, and there's two types of ways to get your carbon which is what we're gonna focus on the most as a, a need. And so that gives us four types of metabolism. We have two different ways to get energy. We have two different ways to get our carbon. That's four, when you combine them all, that's four possibilities. Okay, so let's talk about this. When it comes to energy, let's look at this bottom little thing I'm circling here. There are two ways to get energy. There's Energy from light, basically the sun, we call that photo, okay? So photo is in photon, light energy, okay? That's basically getting your energy from sunlight. And then the other one is from the chemicals themselves that you ingest. You ingest some organic molecules, it has carbon atoms in it, so you get your carbon through chemicals. So we call, uh, we get the energy, uh, I, I'm so sorry, I'm not talking about the carbon yet, I'm talking about the energy. Let me back up, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you can get your energy through light, that's photo, or you can get your energy through chemical energy, which is from the chemical bonds of these complex organic molecules that you eat, then you break those chemical bonds down and release energy. So there's two ways to energy, light and chemical, okay? We call the light energy photo, we call the chemical energy chemo, okay? Now, there's, now let's talk about the ways you get your carbon atoms, okay? There's two ways. One, you just get it through carbon dioxide only, okay? So you're only extracting carbon from carbon dioxide atoms. We call this auto 
carbon dioxide only. We call that an auto process. And then, or you can get the carbon by breaking down a lot of these complex organic molecules that have carbon in them. Okay, and so we call that hetero. Okay, so organic compounds fear carbon, hetero. One last quick review. Two ways to get energy, sunlight photo or chemical energy, chemo. Two ways to get your carbon, carbon dioxide only, auto, organic compounds of any type, hetero. So that gets us into four metabolic classifications. We have your photoautotroph, light energy, carbon dioxide for carbon. We have your chemo autotroph, so auto is the same here, but we changed our energy source. Chemical energy for energy, auto carbon from carbon dioxide only. We have your photo heterotroph, light energy and chemical elements or organic molecules for carbon. And we have your chemo heterotroph, which is to say now we've switched the energy again so chemical energy and then organic molecules. Chemical energy and organic molecules for carbon. Okay, so that's what this table is showing you. The photoautotroph, sunlight energy, carbon dioxide for your carbon source, chemoautotroph, okay, chem organic molecules, whatever for your energy source, auto carbon dioxide for your carbon source. Photoheterotroph, photo light energy, hetero organic compounds for your carbon source, and then chemo heterotroph, chemo organic compounds for your energy source, and then hetero organic compounds for your carbon source. You and I are chemo heterotrophs. Okay, we don't get our energy from the sunlight, we get it from eating and digesting organic molecules, and our uh, carbon source also comes from those organic molecules. So we are chemoheterotrophs, you and me, okay? Animals, okay? Um, okay, so what's an example of a photoautotroph? Well, plants and trees, okay? They sit out there, they collect sunlight, and they get their energy from the sunlight, okay? They respirate carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and that's how they get their carbon, and then they're able to grow. So a plant uses photosynthetic uh, um, processes. Okay. Um, now, uh, a lot of uh, bacteria, say cyanobacteria, uh, that and, and algae, for example, are photoautotrophs as well. Okay, so there are uh, certain um, environments where um, you have chemoautotrophs. So this is something that uh, again gets its energy from organic molecules and then but gets carbon from carbon dioxide. And a perfect example are these things that we're going to talk about at the end of the lecture called extremophiles. They live deep in the oceans. Okay, there's no sunlight, okay. So they use organic molecules to get their energy, but uh, they only use the little carbon dioxide that's around to get their carbon, okay. And these are very simple prokaryotes that live in these extreme environments, okay. All right, so you get the point. We have the four metabolic types. I'd like you to know those four metabolic types and you just have to remember energy two times photo, two types, photo and chemo, and then carbon dioxide, auto or hetero. And then you just mix them up uh, into their four combinations. And it's very interesting that all life on the planet is, um, is based upon one of those four metabolisms. Okay, so let's talk about the metabolism in chemoheterotrophs. And then you'll, you'll see that one of the videos I have is gonna be on this thing that's called the ATD, excuse me, ATP, ADP um, cycle. ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate. The D is for the diphosphate, which means two phosphates. And the ATP is for adenosine triphosphate, T for tri. Okay. 
What's a phosphate? Well, a phosphate group is a phosphorus that's bonded to a bunch of oxygens, okay? Now, this is interesting because phosphate, though it's not one of those highly abundant elements in, in the universe, uh, in terms of what's made in stars, it is made abundantly, but not as abundant as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. It turns out that phosphate turns out to be a damned key element for life as we know it on Earth. Not only is it involved in these phosphate groups that are uh, part of our energy cycle for this complex molecule, adenosine dye and triphosphates, but it turns out that the phosphates form the structural backbone of your DNA, these phosphate groups. You need phosphorus, so don't ever, don't ever turn down something that's got some good phosphorus in it. Mmm, yummy. Okay. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about a molecule that's very complex in its shape. Again, it's a left-handed version of this molecule. Okay, and these right here are the three-dimensional versions of a phosphate group. So here's the schematic of a phosphate group, uh, a phosphate with a double bonded oxygen and then two uh, bonded oxygens here and that minus just means that it's electrically got a polarity that's sort of negative-ish over here and sort of and sort of neutral over here. Um, the thing is that when you look at three-dimensional here we have uh, the orange is the phosphorus, the red are the, are the oxygens. They are bonded together. There's three of them when you have triphosphate or if you knock this one off you get this full molecule, which just has the two phosphates called diphosphate. So if you knock that one off, you've got diphosphate. Uh, this is the uh, adenosine part of the molecule. It serves as the anchor of the triphosphate group or the diphosphate group. And these bonds here between the phosphate groupings are highly energetic. They contain a lot of energy. And it turns out that by, by breaking them, you can then release that energy into the cell. And so, in short, the ADP-ATP cycle is basically putting a phosphate group onto diphosphate, making it triphosphate, and then breaking the phosphate off the triphosphate and leaving you with diphosphate. Energy in, energy out. Energy in, energy out. And so that's what our next slide is going to talk about. And I, the bottom is a screen grab from the video. Uh, that I've given the URL to here, so uh, lest I be uh, considered to be copying and plagiarizing, I wanted to make sure I give my reference as to where I got this slide. Uh, the rest of the images mostly all come from um, the book. Um, so it's interesting, I, I make this joke about food. Uh, food is such a weird word if you think about it, but energy is food, food is energy. Um, so Energy uh, from food is used to bond the phosphate groups uh, to ADP to form the ATP. And then energy is released into the cell and the ATP splits into ADP and a phosphate uh, group that goes free. This is the diagram in the book. I think this diagram stinks. I don't think it really lets you understand anything about what's going on. You know, what's going in here? What, wait, this arrow goes this way, and then there's the, what happens from here to here, and this energy comes out, okay. All right, I think, I think this diagram here is a little bit better, and so I'm gonna go through it. Again, this movie is very short, and the guy does a spectacular job of discussing it, uh, so I, you definitely need to watch this movie, because I want you to understand this. So, uh, first he talks about the ATP, a molecule, the adenosine triphosphate. It's the adenine, uh, adenosine, adenosine molecule uh, bonded to three of these phosphate groups. Okay, ATP. Okay, this is the adenine, uh, adenosine group. Here's one phosphate, two phosphate, and then here's the three phosphates. Okay, it turns out that if you then mix this with water, which you have plenty of in your um, body, that it will uh, allow the breaking of one of these phosphate bonds in the triphosphate group. So what you end up getting when you add some water to this is that the, you get an, 
adenosine diphosphate group and a separated off phosphate that goes into your into your body okay and in addition what happens then is you release energy in this process so when you break that bond you release energy into your cell and that energy then gets used to drive your biochemistry and your metabolism this phosphate eventually uh, what it has done to uh, get, get broken off here is that it has stolen an H and an O out of the H2O and bonded with it. So that's how the, the water steals the phosphate group, is that the phosphate uh, steals the OH from the water and then you have a free proton in your, in your body um, that then eventually gets involved in some other chemistry and bonds with other molecules. But in this process, releases energy and it uses the water molecule to catalyze this process, in other words, to drive it. So when this bond gets broken between the diphosphate, uh, when you turn a triphosphate, an adenosine triphosphate into an adenosine diphosphate with just the two, you're breaking this bond and it's releasing energy into the um, environments. And then Basically, this adenosine phosphate will eventually bond with, a, with a, a phosphate group, stealing it from one of these molecules, um, and the process then can cycle through. Okay, so that's the ATP, ADP cycle. Okay, now we're going to get into the biology of your DNA. Now, I think everybody has seen DNA. They've probably heard it's a double helix molecule. And uh, so I would say that the general idea of what DNA is, is well known to most people or everybody, uh, but let's just go through uh, dissecting it down a little bit more. Some of this review, maybe you'll learn a thing or two in the process, but what I want to say to you is, ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about here is a miracle of the universe, okay? We can dissect this intellectually, but to really fathom this, to really embrace it, you have to understand, you don't have to understand. By trying to understand it, don't forget the absolute amazing miracle that this molecule is. And I'm gonna show some videos that are just gonna show, show you, I think maybe for the first time, that the way that we understand this biochemistry, that these molecules are almost like small little cognizant living creatures, that they know where to go, they know what to do when they get there, and they participate in a process uh, in the same way that individual ants live in a colony or individual bees live in a colony and that's the thing that is so mind-boggling and such a miracle of this process you know at what point does consciousness end and what point does consciousness begin but it almost seems as if these little molecules have a purpose just like individual ants in a colony have a purpose they fit into a whole but they're individuals they certainly have some kind of awareness of their surroundings when does it's just phenomenal so when you watch this one movie that talks about it, it's from a, a youtube veritas um, uh, anyway i linked to it i can't remember which number of movie it is but uh it's it's, it's astonishing and it's a movie that talks about how your cells uh, split and how your DNA line up and, and know when to split. It's fantastic. Okay. Um, so DNA is your molecule of hereditary information. What I want you to think of DNA is, is basically a storehouse of words, a storehouse of letters that make words. And these words then can be put together in ways to create you know, a work of information, uh, a total concept of information. And it's silly, but, you know, you could think of each of these little um, 
codons that are that are aligned in your DNA molecules uh, as, as say letters, and then the groupings of them form something called a gene, or, and then those are like words. And then the words combine together, and they can make you know stories. They can make um, an expression of something much larger uh, than their individual components and provide in the same way that letters can be put together to make words and words can be put together to make meaning, abstract meaning that we, we understand. Uh, the, the same thing happens with the letters and the words or the genes in DNA can form things that have very, very different outcomes and um, in the sense not meanings, but certainly expressions uh, of, of the, you know, a, a, a dragonfly is a very different expression than say a human, okay? Okay, coming back to the slide. Um, so this is a, a, what we call a, a ball model, if you will, of uh, molecules, uh, showing you that it, it definitely has this helical structure um, over here, we have another schematic on your left, panel A, showing this uh, helical structure uh, just presented in a way that you can sort of see these uh, pieces of information that are contained along the inside of this backbone. Um, these uh, pieces of information are molecules that we'll discuss in a little bit. We call them T, A, C, and G. And we're going to find out that there's uh, bonding rules, and we're going to find out that the sequence of these along the backbone, uh, these are like the letters, and then the sequence make up words. Okay, and then what you can do is you can put the sequences together in ways that make your prose or your life form. This is your uh, much more detailed version of that. So these this backbone that you see here. Okay, is made of these groups here. Um, you have basically your phosphate groups that are bonding together this intermediate amino acid. That then, this is the, the these here form the backbones, this blue that you see. And then bonded to these backbone uh, structures are the various amino acids, which are known as C. T, G, and A, okay? And then we have some bonding rules, A and T bond and C and G bond, okay? So you can have A and T or T and A, and you can have G and C or C and G, okay? But you get this sequence along here, C, T, G, A, I mean, it could be C, C, T, T, G, A, you know, whatever, and this forms a, a word, which is a gene, okay? So we're gonna, let me talk about this a little bit more uh, process. Here's what these D and bases uh, look like. Um, these are what are called the codons. Let me go back real quick. So these right here, each one is considered to be a codon and it contains the sequence of these along the backbone contain the information that is being stored. Okay, so this is the T or the thymine. This is the C or the cytosine. This is the A or the adenine. And this is the G called the guanine. And you can see it's made of carbons and nitrogens and hydrogens. And sometimes carbons, nitrogens, hydrogens, and oxygen, okay? And so there's a rule of the bonding, which is based uh, closely on the lock and key model, that the T and the A can bond with each other and that the C and the G combine with each other molecularly, but you don't see cross bonds going TG or CA or CT and AG, basically. Okay, so they're limited in this way, but it still allows the whole diversity of life as we know it. Now, how is this information packaged? Because it's, it's a lot of information and this is contained in every single cell in your body. Okay, all of this information. Okay, all right, so let's, let's talk about that. Um, here's your double helix, okay? Here are your codons, okay? What happens then is that this double helix is wrapped around these little uh, 
organic balls, if you will, called histones, very much packed into these groups. Okay, so here's an image of one of these histones uh, separated out um, in the same way that they've sort of uh, separated them out here. And if you group them in, into groups the, of four, they're called nucleosomes. I'm not going to really ask you to know what a histone or a nucleosome is by name. I'm not going to get down to that level, but I'm just showing you this uh, structure because it's so miraculous and amazing nature is. Um, as you wrap these more into a tight coil, they call this a tight helical fiber, okay? And then they can wrap around on themselves into something called supercoils. And then these supercoils are combined together in this highly, highly compactified thing called basically a chromatid, okay? And then all together, these are called chromosomes, okay? So this contains miles and miles and miles, and I can never remember how big it is, but I think if you stretch your DNA, it would go from here to the sun, uh, you know, if you strung it all out. Um, so when we, when we see these little things, what I want you to understand is that there are these, you know, super coils wrapped up into these helical fibers uh, through these nucleosomes and histones, and then here comes your DNA. Now, it turns out that your DNA is not always just always sitting around in chromosomes. It tends to only go into chromatids or chromosomes when you're getting ready for your, your cells to duplicate. Okay, and that's in one of the movies that, uh, videos that are, are being shown as well. Now, uh, human beings have a total, uh, what's the magic word, 40, sorry, I didn't say magic word. No, I'm not, no. What is the key phrase here of, what is the number of chromosomes that are in humans? That's all I meant to say, okay. All right, um, it's 46. Okay, it turns out that um, a, uh, an egg has 23 of these and the sperm has 23 of these and they come together to make the 46, all right. Um, now, not all life has the same number of chromosomes, okay. For example, dogs have 78 chomosomes, okay, a lot, lot, lot of uh, separation of their packaging, if you will, more so than humans do. Uh, a pufferfish has 42, a cat has 38, sunflower is 34, and maybe a pea plant 14. So you can see that life has different strategies that have allowed it to be adaptive and well-refined for the environments that they live in. And somehow this is clearly an advantage for pea plants to only have 14, and it's an advantage for dogs to have 76 in terms of the way that they evolve through time and the unequal reproductive success of the various things that became dogs, okay? So humans have 46 of these chromosomes, and then uh, this is sort of an image of what they look like when they're, in, in they're packaged into their individual chromatids. Now, um, or, or chromosomes, um, this is a nice little diagram showing you, again, the DNA uh, packed into a chromosome like this, and then that that is located in the nuclear region of your cell, which is uh, inside the nucleus, uh, the nucleus itself uh, inside your eukaryotic cell. And here are your organelles that might be uh, part of your eukaryotic cell. So this is how DNA is packaged. It's highly efficient and that you have these full 46 chromosomes in the nuclear region of every single cell in your body. Okay quick review of what I've been saying in maybe a more graphical form. I want to define two words for you that I do want you to know. One is gene and the other is genome. And it's kind of disappointing, sorry that this is, these are both ones. Um, it's kind of disappointing to me how often people miss my question about what a gene is versus what a genome is or what a DNA molecule is. You know, I, I, um, I have sort of a matching problem that I tend to give. And a lot of people really confuse what a gene is. So I really want to make a point on what a gene is. 
Um, okay, it's a sequence of base pairs that hold in a structural code, one instructional code to do something, right? how to build a protein molecule, how to make a fingernail uh, you know, protein, okay? Um, so if you think about it, you know, your codons are those amino acids, the A, the C, and the T, and the G. And here's your DNA double helix. Here are your codons. And a group of these in order form a gene. Okay, it's a small segment along your larger DNA molecule that the order of these codons provide a, make a word that is an inst part of an instruction for making a protein or something else in your body. Okay, and so eventually what happens is your body will, will, will split this open and it will somehow copy the order of these codons and, and then use that information to go build a protein. We'll, we'll be talking about that shortly. But that's what a gene is. It's a small segment which carries that little code of information, or word of information, uh, and uh, a series, a small segment of codons along your, your entire uh, DNA molecule. Your genome, your genome is the sum of all your genes in your body, okay? So you have all this DNA, all those DNA molecules are broken up into small genes, okay? If you add, if you think about uh, categorizing or identifying every single one of those genes and putting them together as a, uh, you know, in a, as a, on a piece of paper, these are all my genes, that's your full genome, okay? Now, uh, the human genome, uh, is resided in all your 46 chromosomes, which consists of about 3 billion DNA base pairs. Okay, um, that, those, and, and I mean codons, 3 billion or so codons. And of those 3 billion codons, they're in little groups. And the, those groups, there's about 32,000 to 120,000 of those genes, those groups. The, these things right here, those little words that make instructions. Okay, um, it was only 10 years ago that the Human Genome Project uh, was working on this and trying to build a full um, uh, census of our genome, of the human genome. And ladies and gentlemen, they have succeeded at doing that now. And so the human genome has been completely charted, okay? Um, and that's just really ex exciting news if you think about it. Um, what do I have in the box here? Different cell types such as muscle cells or brain cells differ because they express or actually use different portions of your full genome. Okay, so, you know, brain cells uh, are built out, uh, when you want to build new parts to brain cells, you're using, say, certain genes along your, uh, in your genome. And when you want to build a, a hair follicle, uh, you use different genes. And when you want to build a fingernail uh, molecule or cell, then you use different genes. So all that information is always is contained in every single one of your cells, but they know which parts to go look at to reproduce themselves. Don't ask me how. Okay, so DNA replication. There's two things that the DNA are used for. Um, the main one, of course, is that they um, are the instructions on how to keep building new parts of yourselves, okay? So um, the other one is that they have to learn how to completely and totally reproduce one set to a whole other set so that your cells can then divide and you can grow and, and uh, increase the number of cells that you have or, or allow some cells to die and, and form new cells. So this is the, in this box is that process in a sense, you can see that you basically have a mechanism for splitting open their DNA. So it has to come out of the chromosome, come out of the nucleotides and the, the nucleosomes and all that stuff. And then it gets uh, opened up and it, it gets split open. And then there's ways of, uh, building the insides of it. So you can see that the C is bonding to the G and the T to the A and whatnot, and you get mirror uh, versions of each of these. So uh, this strand here, 
okay, that, that came along. This strand here is building a copy of the other strand. And this strand here is building a copy of, the, of its other strand. And so in the end, you get two new versions of your DNA molecule. It's called the daughters. And this is how DNA duplicates itself in principle. There's a lot of details going on in here, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, the other thing is that uh, you can um, use the little genes to, um, as words that you put together to uh, make instructions to build things like protein molecules and things that you need in your body or white blood cells that you can, uh, the, the parts of the blood white cells that you need to fight immunity or have for your immunity. Uh, so cells need to duplicate as part of life. That's the duplication of the DNA, but also they must um, um, create things like proteins. So in, in this sense, uh, here's an example of these amino acid codons that uh, have been constructed and float freely um, in your cells and your, your uh, double helix splits open you have your codons in order here, T, A, C, G, T, C, G, whatever. And this makes up the, the information, the word, uh, the instructions. Now, um, when you're building proteins, it turns out that um, the first thing your gene does is it builds a messenger uh, strand. Uh, it's called RNA or messenger RNA. And you'll notice that the RNA gets built up this way. And then the RNA is going to leave the cell. Uh, sorry, it's going to leave the membrane and go out into the cell and make a protein. So um, this is a good movie that talks about this, and it's also linked to as one of the movies in the slide set. This is called transcription. Okay, so this process here is called transcription. It happens in the nucleus where the DNA is. Okay, and then it forms a an RNA molecule, which is a single strand that contains now the codon information along it, okay? And then translation occurs, which uh, is shown in another movie, which is a, another spectacular uh, situation where basically, you know, little molecules are put together. Uh, they're carried over by little molecules to a place where there's a factory, which then inserts them along the RNA molecule, and then it separates out and makes a protein. It's, it's an amazing movie. You, you've got to watch this little uh, movie. Um, so the um, situation is that the, the DNA opens up, it transcribes to make an RNA molecule, which then again is uh, used as a little instructional sheet by a factory which puts together the protein. Okay. So what's the difference between DNA and RNA? Uh, well, obviously, the first one is that DNA is a double helix when it's uh, bonded together. Um, and RNA is only a single uh, backbone of that, but contains the complementary code of one of the sides of the DNA strand. Okay. Uh, whereas the um, codons in DNA are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And we know that T bonds to A and G to C and C to G and A to T, as we, we can see here. Um, it turns out that RNA doesn't use the thymine. It uses uracil to replace the thymine. And then when it uh, comes back to make uh, the, the um, protein, the uracil replaces that with thymine. I'm not quite sure why all that happens, but it does. And it turns out that when you have an A codon here, uh, when you're doing transcriptions, instead of a thymine bonding to that A, a uracil will bond to that A. So you, instead of getting a T here, you get a U. And um, you might have seen that in the previous diagram here. Um, we have a T bonding to an A, but where we have an A, instead of it bonding to a T, it bonds to a U for the RNA, okay? So I just wanted to point that out, that those are the two differences between RNA and DNA. RNA is uh, only a single strand with codons, and it, it doesn't have thymine. It uses uracil. Okay. And so here's a diagram of this process. Again, there's this, the, the movie that shows this in real time. It's spectacular to watch. 
you get the real feeling that, that these little molecules are alive. They're like little ants in an ant hill. They're doing their thing. They know what they're doing. It's spectacular um, and, and miraculous. Uh, so again, here's your DNA. There might be a segment here that we call a gene, okay? There's this uh, thing called a, a polymerase that um, is responsible for bringing these things together and, and letting the duplication happen. Again, it's in the video. It's very spectacular. And so um, then you get the RNA being transcribed along here. Notice that where you have A's, you get U's. Here we have T's, you still get A's and G, C, C, G. What? Okay, and then after the transcription happens, this is in the membrane, you can see this membrane here of the nucleus, the RNA will break off and it will move on out into the outer part of the cell called the cytoplasm. And then this is your information from your gene, okay? And this then now is brought into a little factory, which I don't remember the name of, and that little factory then processes it and these little other molecules bring in these little groups of organic molecules and bond them to the RNA in the right sequence and then they leave and curl up into something that we call a protein. So watch the movies, they are amazing. And if, if you don't think life is a miracle, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's an astonishing thing and I don't understand why it, why it happens. Why this, why this chemistry happens. It, it's kind of like, like I said, watching a beehive or watching a, an anthill and saying, you know, gosh, well, I, I kind of get it because each ant has a brain and it's aware of what it's doing and it responds to its environment. But how do you, how do you say that with, if all of those ants instead were just small organic molecules? Okay. How do, how do they, as small individual organic molecules, know to be a worker molecule or a messenger molecule? Or how do they know how to go from one place to the other in the cell or grab a certain other uh, mo organic molecule and drag it over to the factory? That's where I just really am in awe of the, the, the I don't want to call it magic, but the miracle of this process, which is going on in every single one of your cells at lightning speed, okay? When you watch that movie, you have to understand that this process we're describing is happening in real time at rapid speed. The, the, the way that these RNA molecules get built up is just like faster than that. And it's happening in every one of your cells right now. Okay, now, given that it's going and making these things very rapidly, you know, the U, the A, the C, the T, the blah, 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 blah. Okay, errors can happen, what we call an error in transcription, okay? And so uh, you can imagine, for example, that you have a base sequence, in other words, you know, T, A, C, G, et cetera, et cetera, in a, in that, that form uh, a sequence. Okay, and so this might be the one that you have, and it might be, you know, I'm just gonna put our letters in there so I can make words that we understand. You know, T-H-E-F-A-C-C-A-T-A-T-E-T-H-E-R, blah, blah, blah. And so this might have some message to it, our gene, uh, you know, and be the, the fat cat ate the rat, okay? So that's the biological meaning or whatever. I, I know it's really stupid and silly, but you'll, you'll get the point here. Now, if for some reason uh, there's an offset, okay, where this EAF, uh, let's say that F um, or an A gets stuck in between the E and the F, okay? So now it's, you know, the uh, uh, fat cat A, okay. but everything's offset. And so, you know, as those molecules are coming into the factory and getting put on there, there's gonna be this offset that's gonna kind of screw up the, the protein, okay, that gets built. And so instead of the protein being the fat cat ate the rat protein, it's the alpha to cat the the rat protein, which of course isn't a protein um, that your body knows how to interpret perhaps, 
or it can interpret it pretty well and you know limping along it can interpret it and do quite well okay the interesting thing is that maybe maybe that's something that works better for you in the long run uh, given the environment you're in than uh, the old the fat cat ate the rat protein okay. all right anyway that's one uh, modification where you get uh, uh, something inserted in between two of your codons and so you're off sequence uh, from your biological meaning. Or you could have a situation where you drop the, I just said we're going to drop the E, um, and so we got the, the rat, and then so we get something that sounds like Bill the Cat uh, trying to talk. And if you don't know who Bill the Cat is, uh, you should Google it. Um, my day when I was in college, uh, there was a, a comic strip uh, with Bill the Cat in it. I think it was called Doonesbury um, or Bloomfield. Or I, oh, well, I guess I can't remember. That's how good it was. Uh, anyway, the, one of the best uh, characters was uh, Bill the Cat. And Bill the Cat used to always just go around going and crazy things like that. He was kind of a tard. Anyway. Um, so your protein becomes the bill of cat protein and uh, doesn't do so well. Okay, so um, these genes um, make biological sense or they can make biological nonsense during mutation or it could be that the mutation actually uh, makes the protein such that it, it, when it reconstructs a blood cell or something like that, uh, it kind of does it a little bit funny or does it wrong and in fact this is one of the things that happened, a mutation happened uh, to humanity. And so that the red blood cells that got created, instead of them being these beautiful round sort of donut shaped things, uh, they became sickles. Okay, sort of like a, a half, uh, like a, a crescent moon looks to you. Okay, um, and it turned out that this case of sickle cell and um, uh, blood cells, which we give a name to called sickle cell anemia, uh, is resistant to malaria, uh, so that malaria doesn't uh, doesn't take hold in your body if you have sickle cells. Um, and so, guess what? Um, that can be an advantage. If all of a sudden the whole world became plagued with malaria, those people who have sickle cell anemia uh, are going to have some unreproductive success because they're not going to get killed off by the malaria, and then pretty soon all humans will have sickle cell anemia, and that will just be the way we are. That's evolution, people. Now, um, the thing is, is that under normal circumstances, sickle cell anemia doesn't let you process oxygen as well, and therefore it, it is kind of a disadvantaged trait to have in our normal environment. But if the environment changed, such that malaria was everywhere, I think you follow the logic. And so, this actually has happened in parts of the world, okay? Uh, these errors happen. So here's a normal red blood cell up here. Here's what a sickle cell red blood cell looks like. And here's some other diagrams showing that, you know, a person with sickle cell anemia having some of these sickle cells. And this just came from a small uh, base pair being attached incorrectly to another base pair in the process of making the proteins. Now the proteins are always made this way when they conformed to make themselves into red blood cells, then the instructions to making the blood cells, et cetera, are wrong, and you get the sickle cells, okay? Um, now, um, other errors can happen besides that, the wrong base pair attached. You can get the deletion, as I said. You can um, have the extra base pair. These are the examples for the previous slide, but you can also, uh, if you got struck by an alpha particle or a beta particle or a gamma ray, um, you could then uh, damage a part of a gene in your, in your DNA molecule, and then it would always reproduce the long, long little protein, and then you could get something like uh, sickle cell anemia if um, that happened to be the mutation that happened, or it could become cancer, but you don't know. Okay, so then you can have modification from chemicals as well. They get, they get in there and they just wreak havoc on the process. Okay, so um, an A was changed to a T in one location along the hemoglobin molecules um, that result from the proteins that are made. 
And so this uh, makes it, um, this is a debilitating disease in many ways because of the way you can process uh, the um, uh, oxygen. And also when the blood cells go through capillaries, they can get caught, okay, and cause, cause the blood flow to get stopped in, in the little capillaries, which is where your oxygen is transmitted from your blood into your body, okay. But it turns out they suppress malaria. So turns out if you're gonna take a census of people around the planet, where are you gonna find people where the, the, a large fraction of that population has sickle cell anemia? And where on the earth will you find people where only a small fraction have sickle cell anemia? Go up to the parts of the planet where there's a lot of malaria. Okay, when mosquitoes are transmitting malaria, and so malaria is really a, a problem. You go to those regions of the planet and you take a census, you're going to find out that a large fraction of the human population in those regions where there's malaria have sickle cell anemia. Now, I think you understand the processes why that happened. Because if you don't have sickle cells, you get malaria, you die, you don't have kids. So the people with sickle cell. They live, they have kids. Even though in general, in our normal environment, the mortality rate of somebody with sickle cell anemia would be higher than that with normal blood, okay? But with malaria as a very important part of that environment, those ratios, those numbers change in terms of mortality. And it turns out that people have a higher rate of mortality due to malaria than they do to uh, the complications with sickle cell anemia. And so you have, ladies and gentlemen, unreproductive success in different parts of the planet with regards to sickle cell anemia. Great illustration of uh, unequal reproductive success. All right, coming in on the home stretch, we're going to talk about the extreme uh, versions of life that are on the planet, the extremophiles. So we're getting pretty close. Uh, I think we're on slide 25 and 31, as you can see in the, in the page window up there. Okay, so extremophiles, these are lovers of the extreme. Um, now, let's just dive in and talk about some of the uh, environments. Um, Perhaps you've seen uh, or heard of black smokers. These are geothermal vents in the bottom of the ocean. You have magma coming up, uh, very hot, chemically rich, organically chemically rich, a lot of sulfuric acids and silicates and things like that, sulfurs. Um, a lot of heat energy coming out of these areas. And you can see the new uh, basaltic rock uh, forming around these vents as, uh, as the molten rock uh, solidifies. Um, okay, so you get the igneous rock. Um, the temperatures of this material can be up to 700, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, water boils at 212, so you might be thinking, oh, this is boiling material. It's going to make the water boil around here. Ah, not so fast. When you're at the bottom of the ocean and you're under two miles of water, you're under a tremendous amount of pressure and that water is very, very pressurized. And it turns out that water boils at a much higher temperature when it's highly pressurized. And so this, the boiling point of this water is over a thousand degrees. Maybe, I don't know the number, but it might be 1500 or 2000 degrees Fahrenheit before it can boil, okay? So this is 750 degree water, okay? It is hot stuff. These are super high pressure. I mean, you could not survive in these pressures. You would literally be uh, painfully uh, crushed with time uh, in minutes that you would die if you could breathe, okay? Um, there are some prokaryotic cells that you carry down here that metabolize sulfuric acid, okay? and they get their carbon from the carbon dioxide. Okay, so what are these called? Okay, chemoautotrophs. Okay, they get their energy from chemicals and they get their carbon auto from carbon dioxide. Okay, so you have some chemoautotrophs that thrive in these environments. Okay, oh look, it's written right there. 
I feel so proud of myself because I didn't even see that. And yet I was able to figure it out. Of course, I've given this lecture probably for 20 years now, 15 years. Okay, um, so let's see. We call these thermophiles, okay, and lovers of the, the, the hot, if you will, okay. Um, they would die in normal sunlight. They, if you brought them up to put them on the beach, forget it. They're gone. They're goners. Okay, we love that environment. They hate that environment. They love these hot, high-density environments, okay. Um, now, that's not to say that some extremophiles live in conditions intermediate to these ones that live down here in the black smokers, and we'll, we'll, I'll show some of those in a minute, that, that live basically in regions where sunlight still does can penetrate on them. So there's a whole range of these extremophiles that can exist. And here are some of the thermophiles that uh, have adapted to living even where there's sunlight. Um, if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, I think this is called the Great Chromatitid. Um, I'm not good with names, so I may have that name a little bit wrong, but this is a uh, hot thermal pool, and you can see how large it is because uh, these are individuals here walking along this boardwalk, and I've, I've done this before. It's, it's quite amazing. Now, what you're seeing here uh, in this very hot water pond um, are different ecological niches for different thermophiles, okay? Toward the top of the water, you see you're getting a lot of sunlight still uh, coming in, and the water is the coolest of any of the water because it's cooled down, and you have those thermophiles which actually can live in sunlight and um, live in water that might only be a few hundred degrees, and they, they prefer that kind of environment. As you go down, you're going to higher pressures and you're going to hotter water. And so you have this yellow ring and then the green and the blue and then in the deep blue. These are the um, colors of the bacteria or the thermophiles that actually live in these um, different environments. You can still get light all the way down here and then basically these thermophiles, the way they interact with light, that they absorb light, the, the light that they don't absorb, in the case of these, is dark blue. In the case of these, it's, it's the orange light that they don't absorb, okay? And so you see the, the orange light reflecting off of them. And so you see that each one of these ecological niches, you have a different type of thermophile that is uh, evolved to be specialized for these different layers of these and ecological environments, even within a single hot thermal pond. And the whole earth is like this. Every single degree of temperature or pressure or chemical makeup or amount of sunlight, life has found a way and become highly specialized and filled that ecological niche. And the whole planet is covered in a biomass that has filled every possible ecological niche that life can live in, okay? And we have been discovering recently some ecological niches we thought life could never ever exist in, and lo and behold, life has found a way and exists there. So we are the minority. We live in a very narrow range. All life lives in a very narrow range, okay, because it's highly specialized for its environment. But all of the ranges that exist on the planet have been filled by biology, living matter. Here's the other extreme, the cold, okay? Okay, we call these lithosphiles because they live in the ground, litho being, you know, the earth itself, um, and these things called endospores, which are uh, prokaryotic resting cells, okay, if you think of endospores. Um, so these are things that really have slow metabolism, they really uh, will go through hibernation periods, and they can go through very long hibernation periods, okay? This is an example of this green here, of an endosphere, or sphere, endospore, that is a lithophile, okay, that exists in the polar regions, which are in the darkness without the sun for six months out of the year. 
And during those six months, they go into a dormant phase. They hardly metabolize at all. And they just slumber away until the sun comes out six months later. And take astronomy 101 if you want to know why the sun's only out six months a year at the poles. Okay, but it has to do with the tilt of the Earth and the where it is in its orbit uh, during the time of year. But when you get to that point in the time of year when summer comes for one of the polar reasons, say the North Pole, um, then the sunlight begins to melt the water. The water melts, the minerals flow down. These little uh, lithophiles uh, detect the water, they detect the minerals that are there and available for them to feed off of, and they wake up, they start metabolizing, they reproduce, they do their thing, and then six months later they shut down again and they just wait it out and they go through the cycle. So this is an environment where we would definitely freeze. They don't uh, live in the sunlight, okay? Um, not our environment, but yet life has evolved to uh, highly, highly specialized, very, very uh, fine-tuned and, in, in a sense, cosmically engineered to exist in this particular environment, okay? Now, um, this is a picture of Mars. It's a kind of an old picture of Mars. We know that liquid water has existed on Mars. And so one of the things we're going to, we have a whole chapter on Mars where we're going to talk about this, but these are uh, candidates, these lithophiles are candidates for possible life forms on Mars. That even the exploration we've done on Mars now, the chances of us are picking them up uh, by scooping a couple holes and, you know, Imagine we sent probes to the Earth and we, you know, dug a hole in Kansas and, and we dug another hole in France and we dug another hole, say, in Australia. And then, you know, we didn't find any life in those three little scoops of dirt. We'd be like, Ugh, lifeless planet. Well, so far out of all the little scoops of dirt we've picked up, we haven't really had any definitive signs of living matter in Mars. But, you know, we've only picked up a few scoops. Um, so... Let's not get too worried about that right now. Um, we'll also show later on that, that there are people who believe that life probably might persist in underground caves on Mars where you have liquid water and, and you have these uh, situation, uh, uh, very unprotected environments. All right, so I'm going to end with these uh, last slides, which are going to sort of talk about the cutting edge of, of some interesting thoughts. Um, about, you know, do we believe in abiogenesis on the planet Earth or that it came from somewhere else and what was the common ancestor? Um, and so we don't know the answer to those questions. I'm not really going to try and address abiogenesis, but I do want to talk about a couple critters that uh, might be able to live in space or places that we might consider incapable of supporting life. Um, Okay, so let's talk about one of these endospores that you know about uh, that, that has the common name anthrax. It's a Bacillus anthracus. Um, it turns out that this thing can go super dormant, okay? Um, super toxic to humans, all right? Um, anyway, it can live with no water. It can exist through extreme heat. It can exist through extreme cold. It can even exist and uh, lay dormant in the vacuum of space. We do not know for how long. It would be an experiment we should probably conduct, but we should have our hazmat suits on when we do that. And it's very possible, this is the kind of thing that if it got knocked off the earth on a rock uh, and traveled through the solar system for the next uh, 16,000 years or 16 million years and landed on another planet and that had some water on it, like it turns out the moon has some permafrost water on it. And, Mars has some permafrost water on it, and maybe even liquid water. We haven't caught it, but we've seen evidence that Mars has had little outflows of water from some of the sides of uh, craters and things like that. And we have definitely have liquid water in the moons of Jupiter and the moons of Saturn. And clear, we've found huge reservoirs of water out there. So if it needs water to live and a little energy, you put some anthrax on the moon Europa around Jupiter, and I guarantee you it's going to take a foothold. It's going to be able to survive in that environment. Okay. And even if it took 16 million years to get there, it might be able to do it. Okay. 
Now let's talk, talk about these little things called tardigrades. If you've uh, ever seen one of these before, or images of them, they look kind of like these little bears, okay? Now when they're hydrated, they're very much alive and you know interested in their surroundings and eating little critters and doing their things. Um, and this is what they look like active, but they can dehydrate and go into a dormant stage and survive just about anything you can throw at it, okay? So um, they expel their water uh, um, and generate compounds that seal and protect their structure, okay? They can remain in this so-called, uh, I must have lost a letter here, uh, but dormant state for months and still revive in the presence of water. We have actually put them in a deep freeze for up to 30 years. And in 2016, they brought them out happy as could be, okay? Um, they can survive boiling, freezing, high pressures, vacuum of space, which is to say the ultimate low pressure, no pressure. Uh, the European Space Agency has um, put water, these little water bears, they're called also tardigrades, into orbit, they have survived. It turns out we found one weakness and that is ultraviolet radiation. It turns out that if you're out in space, the sun emits a lot of ultraviolet radiation in addition to its visible radiation or, or light. And the, the ultraviolet light uh, turns out that this can, um, it's their kryptonite, you, even if they're in their ton stage, I guess that's what it's called. See, they call it ton up here. So I guess I didn't have a typo. Um, this is the first time I presented this slide and I don't know much about tardigrades. So I thought I'd share what little I do know about them um, because they're fascinating in this regard. But, uh, you know, you talk about what kryptonite is, that's a, uh, generic word for your weakness, uh, like an Achilles heel, Achilles heel. And um, this apparently can cause uh, death, even in the ton state of, um, of these tardigrades, okay? Now, this is interesting because maybe some of you have heard, maybe some of you don't keep track of what's going on in the world around you, uh, as well as others. But um, in April of 2019, India, had sent a spacecraft that was meant to do a soft landing on the moon. And this would have made them the third nation, uh, or fourth nation to soft land on the moon besides US, Russia, and China. And um, they, they didn't make it, um, it crashed. And it turns out that one of their experiments was they wanted to see if tardigrades could survive on the moon. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that, that controlled experiment is no longer controlled. It is now an uncontrolled experiment in the fact that when the spacecraft hit and exploded, the tardigrades got spewed all over the place in ways we don't even understand. We don't know how many of them survived, but we believe that millions of tardigrades are now on the surface, uncontrolled on the moon, and um, who knows what's going to happen. So tardigrades may take a foothold on the moon, uh, they may stay in their ton stage or their hydrated stage for quite a while. But we do know that there are regions on the moon that have permafrost of water in the surface. And so if they can adapt to that, they could come out of their slumber, reproduce, and their numbers could grow. And maybe because that environment is so extreme, because of individual variation amongst these millions of tardigrades, some may be able to actually survive in that environment and reproduce, and some parts of the population do not have the traits that they can survive and they won't reproduce, and therefore you will have unequal reproductive success and the tardigrades will then become a version of tardigrade that is very adaptable in, uh, to survival on a surface like the moon. You just don't know what's going to happen. But that's the process of Darwinism that could happen on the moon. So that's a very, very uh, fun story that I really am happy to be able to tell, even though I'm, I'm a little bit uh, worried about if, when we get back to the moon, whether it's going to be tar tardigrade central or not. And we'll go there and find some cities with tardigrades in them. Um, now, uh, getting close to last but not least, um, 
guess what was recently found? So this is a news article uh, from Technology and um, Science out of Canada. Okay, it's um, I believe from 2019. Uh, no, sorry, November of 2018. And what you're looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is a, a new type of microbe that has never been seen before. Um, and it doesn't fit on the tree of life. All right, I, I really want to um, make a point here. If you buy a new book on astrobiology, edition four or five of the textbook, it's gonna just show the three trees of life. But science outstrips the textbooks. It's constantly changing what we learn. And guess what? I'm now sharing with you, there's a fourth branch, major branch to the tree of life, which we've never seen before, but was found quite casually from the story. If you go to this website and read the story, it was just some people taking a walk, some biologists doing some very simple work and discovered this thing. Okay. Anyway, this is an electron microscope. It's called... Um, a hemimastic, I'm not even going to try, okay, and, um, and it's apparently named after some ogre and some uh, mythology of a culture that I'm also unfamiliar with, which I believe might be a culture from northern Canada, sort of uh, out of reverence to the local uh, area it was found. Um, anyway, here's a quote from the, the article. It says uh, they're more different from any other organism or animals or fungi um, than any others. And so they represent a completely new part on the tree of life. Okay. And you can even see it was written up in the journal Nature. They represent a major branch that we didn't know that we were missing. Okay. And there's nothing we know that's closely related to them. So this here is apparently, um, I think, uh, electron microscope version. And um, I can't remember whether this, this is a, a version of the new life form too, but I know definitely that this is one of the, the new life forms. And I apologize, I don't know that much about this article, but I threw this together uh, just at the last minute before I started the lecture uh, in an attempt to just try in the spirit to show you that there's this new information that continues to come out in science that it's constantly pushing uh, that is alive, that it's well, it's not black and white, it's not frozen information, it is always moving forward. Human knowledge is always moving forward. Now, uh, I, last things I want to talk about are viruses. Are viruses alive? Well, we'll ask that in the next slide. Um, and obviously, the reason I want to talk a little bit about viruses is because, well, we're all in quarantine. And the reason I'm giving this lecture over, you know, uh, the web is, is because uh, we're all quarantined from the coronavirus. Um, now, we also recently talked about global warming. And as the Earth is warming, we are learning that uh, the polar cap, the North Polar Cap in particular, has receded dramatically. The glaciers in Greenland are receding dramatically. Now, we've talked about dormant life forms um, um, that live in the ground that uh, wait until the opportunity arises for them to come out of their dormant state. And we don't know a whole lot about how long those dormant states can be. But here is a virus that was dormant for up to 30,000 years, okay? And this virus has now come back to wakey-wakey stage and is active and reproducing, uh, finding hosts to infect and reproducing, okay? It turns out that it's not dangerous to humans uh, in its current um, um, mutation stage. Uh, but it does affect amoeba, and um, it can go in and infect, infect these and, and reproduce this way. Okay, so it was found in a Siberian permafrost that had thawed, um, we believe, due to global warming. And they said that its contagion poses no danger to humans or animals, but um, viruses like this, this is what they're warning, and this is why I'm bringing up that, viruses like this could, um, become, they said, unleashed as the ground becomes exposed. It's a kind of a, an interesting word, unleashed, but uh, has a connotation. But they certainly, uh, 
viruses that we've never seen before uh, could arise, uh, come out of their dormant stages and get engaged in the biosphere in ways that they haven't been for 30, 40, 50, uh, who knows how long, thousands of years. And of course, this is kind of frightening because it poses a, um, a variation on our environment. And when we have variations on our environment, the unequal reproductive success, the balance of that changes from one type of uh, expression of your genes to another expression of the genes. And uh, I don't mean your, I mean your species and things can change. So again, global warming can change our environment in ways that we hadn't anticipated, not just saying the oceans rise and we have to like, you know, move to the poles and live there instead of living on the equator. But in terms of the biosphere, it can actually uh, introduce uh, new uh, stresses and strains to the biosphere. And last but not least, uh, let's talk about uh, Mr. Corona, Mr. Coronavirus COVID-19. Here's a, a diagram of them here. You've seen these little things that are sticking out. That's what gives it the name Corona. Um, but these are little uh, spicules, I forget the exact name of them, that they're very efficient at latching on and uh, into uh, proteins that are uh, on your and your cells and then breaking, opening your cells and getting in there and depositing their DNA um, into your DNA and your nucleus and borrowing your mechanism to reproduce their DNA instead of your DNA. Um, so uh, notice this gray area here. This is a, a lipid uh, membrane. Remember the lipids that I showed you, the, bi the bilayered lipid membrane, okay? Now, why do they say it's so good to wash your hands and things like that? Because uh, it turns out that soap tears these things apart, okay? Uh, soap is a long organic molecule. It's kind of like a, 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 a long uh, molecule with like little hooks coming out of it, except, you know, the hooks are really just different atoms and molecules uh, forming things that, that tend to have that shape. And it turns out that when you rub these lipids, uh, it tears them apart. And so that the, uh, the, the lipid outer layer gets ripped apart by the suds of the soap and then you just wash them away and, and they're gone. And um, so the, the, the DNA material can't, can't survive unless it's protected in the membrane and the whole thing dies and you wash it down the drain. Um, but we wanna ask ourselves a question, uh, are virus li viruses living organism? And the answer is not really because they can't reproduce their DNA without a host. Okay, so they're, they're there's sort of this quasi thing in between not living and living, okay? Anyway, uh, this is all material that I cut and paste from uh, Wikipedia virus here, and it's talking about what a virus is, and it's basically this organism that will um, use other organisms, uh, mechanisms, biological and metabolic mechanisms uh, to reproduce its own DNA, okay? So really, it's just a bag of, of genetic material. Um, and then um, it, it uh, has a protein or a lipid coating. And then it uh, protects that. And it remains dormant, waiting to find a host. And then it uses the, the reproductive mechanisms of the host to, re to reproduce itself. And on that lovely note about coronavirus uh, and how it's affected our lives, um, I'm going to go ahead and end this lecture. Hello, I'm back, full screen. Um, I hope you uh, got some things out of that and enjoyed it. And I want to highly recommend that you watch all of the videos that I've shown. Uh, not only do I have the right to ask testing quiz questions about them, um, but the bottom line is that um, the material in those videos is, is far more informative than the, all the blah, blah, blah that you hear me talking about, um, especially if you're visually oriented in your learning. And, you know, I'd just like to finally say, YouTube is an amazing source to learn TED Talks, um, all these different various channels where you can learn about anything in the world that you want. So uh, if you want to watch Kim Kardashian and reality TV, uh, that's fine. But in 40 years ago, 40 years go by, 
Uh, you're going to know a lot about a bunch of people, but you're not going to know a lot about the world around you. If you want to know that um, and get inspired by what's out there, take part in it. Use YouTube for its educational points um, and purposes. I, I, another soapbox of mine, apologize. I promised I wouldn't do that anymore. But it's a great resource, and I hope some of you will explore YouTube, PBS Space Time, PBS Eons, all this stuff. So some of the videos that, that uh, I've been showing um, come from those resources. Anyway, enjoy. And um, oh, one last thing. I apologize. I think this is the last video that I'm recording on Zoom. And so you won't be seeing me in the corner anymore. You'll just be listening to my voice uh, showing the slides. So it's going to be a little bit of a shift in that regard. And so um, this might be the last time you see me lecture. So I'm just going to say it's uh, been nice to be on video. And I, I hope it's been nice for you to be able to see me while giving the talks. Um, and it's been helpful. But from now on, um, It'll just be voice overlay on the slides. Um, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can do some things to, to help uh, guide the eye uh, by doing some YouTube um, um, movie editing. And, uh, but other than that, this will be the last time I record on Zoom and the last time that you'll see me in the little window up in the corner. So uh, you all take care. And um, we'll continue monitoring the class. And I will, of course, be on Zoom for the uh, office hours, and um, we'll see you all um, hopefully on, on the office hours. And hope you're enjoying the class and take care.